Hi everyone and welcome back to our second session of the day. Um, great to see you all um, zooming back in with us. Um, just a few logistical things before I do the formal introduction, just to let you know that the session is being recorded. Um, the chat is on, please use it, please ask questions throughout the session. Um, at the after Clive's presentation, we will be taking questions. So please use the raise your hand button if you'd like to ask any questions. For those of you that don't know where it is, there should be a button at the bottom that says reactions. And if you press that, there should be an option to raise your hand. If you can't find it, you can message me in the chat and I'll try and help you with that. Um, please keep yourself on mute um, throughout. And if you do ask a question, we will ask you to unmute yourselves. So without further ado, I'm delighted um, that we are now joined by Clive Lawton. Um, Clive has educated on March of the Living for over six years, and he has been involved in Holocaust education since the 80s, and has developed lots of Holocaust educational programs for all ages. In this session, Clive will explore the strange phenomenon that many Jews have today on the two key sites of pilgrimage, Jerusalem and Auschwitz. So Clive, how do we make sense of these two sites that demand so much Jewish attention? Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. Just nod enthusiastically if you can. I might be the last uh, flicker of enthusiasm. And I see folks that I know and recognize from my former community in Muswell Hill. That's very nice. Um, so, um, First of all, let's, uh, there's a whole range of concepts here which we need to unpack. Um, uh, and let's remember, in a sense, how recent the history is. You know, we tend to think of history, of course, when we went to school, you know, Henry VIII was there, wasn't he? There's not much anybody could do about it. He'd, he'd been there for ages. And, uh, and the stories we told were exactly the same stories, presumably as our parents were told about Henry VIII, and no doubt very similar to the ones that our children would be told about Henry VIII as well. But actually, history is continuously changing because history is the interaction between us and the, uh, uh, and the information that we have from the past. And because we're continuously changing, our perspective is continuously changing, our understanding of history changes. Um, some of you will be familiar with the term revisionist and uh, famously re revisionist historians, many of you will know, um, was the term which was applied very um, critically uh, to Holocaust deniers. So when we first came across this phenomenon of Holocaust deniers, a revisionist historian was somebody who tried to say that the Holocaust didn't exist. Right? What were they doing? They were revising history. But of course, being a revisionist is an entirely respectable aspect of history. From time to time, somebody comes along and says, you know what you used to think about this or that historical phenomenon? Well, I'm going to argue it isn't like that anymore. So, for example, probably uh, we all know the Vikings as a bunch of uh, savage you know, pillagers and, and rapists and looters and whatnot, you know, with, with horns sticking out of their helmets. Well, apparently they didn't have any horns sticking out of their helmets. Vikings didn't do that. Um, but furthermore, you know, perhaps they were a slightly more responsible lot than we give them credit for. Um, so over time, history gets revised and our perspective on things or increased knowledge of things leads us to have to change what we thought about that. Um, so here we are, uh, I'm, I'm bringing to you two historical phenomena which contemporary Jews, I think, seek to engage with uh, very physically, very directly. Um, I'm not sure how many other places you'd want to nominate, and perhaps if you do, you might put it in the chat, I suppose, how many other places you'd want to nominate. But I think a significant proportion of today's Jews would say, that an educated, engaged, thoughtful, contemporary Jew um, would not really have their Jewish experience complete, would not really know the story of the Jewish people if they had not been to, if they'd not seen Jerusalem, if they'd not visited Auschwitz. These two sites 
becoming increasingly sites that Jews must go to. Well, of course, when I was a kid, uh, and I'm very old, uh, so I'm talking about the middle of the last century, uh, but when I was a kid, um, uh, for a Jew to go to Jerusalem was a rare privilege. Uh, not many Jews did go off to Israel, visit Israel. Uh, that didn't really get going properly uh, until international travel became there very much easier. Um, so for a Jew to go to Jerusalem was, was a rare opportunity. Somebody who had been there was kind of somebody you'd interview and ask them. And of course, they had they gone um, in those days, I'm talking about the 50s, the early 60s, the Jerusalem they would have seen would have been a shadow, a fraction of the Jerusalem that we would now visit. Because, of course, Jerusalem in those days was, was divided. Um, they wouldn't have been able to get to the Western Wall. They wouldn't have seen the old city. They would, certainly wouldn't have uh, walked on the Temple Mount. Um, they would have just seen uh, what used to be called West Jerusalem, effectively the new bit of Jerusalem. Um, they wouldn't have seen the, the old, the classical, the historical bit. Um, nor, of course, would they have seen some uh, grand things like the Cardo, you know, that great uh, Roman thoroughfare that runs through Jerusalem. Well, it hadn't been excavated. Nobody even knew it was there. Well, they probably knew it was there, but they certainly couldn't see it um, uh, uh, until much later. So there are all kinds of things that we just wouldn't have known about or wouldn't have been able to see even if we'd gone um, and anyway couldn't go. And, and the same is even more true, of course, of Auschwitz. Uh, there were a tiny fraction of, of, uh, of my contemporaries uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s who would have gone to Auschwitz. The Iron Curtain was a real thing. Uh, visiting Poland was a rare opportunity for a tiny handful of uh, specialists, I guess, you know, privileged individuals who might go. Uh, it wasn't until the Iron Curtain uh, fell um, that being able to visit uh, Poland at all and visit uh, Auschwitz uh, became uh, a common possibility. So perhaps for us here now in 2021, um, I'm not talking about pandemic days where nobody can go anywhere much, um, but uh, perhaps for us in 2021, the ease with which we might speculate on shall I visit Jerusalem? Shall I visit Auschwitz? It's important to remember that those options just weren't available uh, to most of our contemporaries just three, four decades ago, not very long ago, and certainly without doubt in my lifetime and, and, and possibly in, in many of yours as well. Um, so that idea that my, uh, me as a Jew, my Jewishness, is completed or constructed or refined or perfected or enriched by being able to go to these sites. It's just not an idea that could have existed if you'd been talking to a Jew in, say, 1960. Um, you say to them, well, of course, I mean, you can't really understand the Jewish story unless you stand in Auschwitz. They just look at you like, well, who's ever going to do that? Right. Um, it, it, you know, how could a Jew take themselves seriously if they haven't stood at the Western Wall? You know, you can't you can't get there. How can you do it? Right. So these things already have changed in terms of our understanding of how a Jew might respond to these places just simply by their accessibility. Um, certainly when I first went to uh, Jerusalem, in the very early 70s, the narrative of Jerusalem, of course, now there was access to the Western Wall, it still hadn't been uh, as uh, spronced up as it is now, but the narrative was all about, you know, Jordanian snipers and the, and the, the line and the trenches and ammunition hill and things like that. Go to Jerusalem now, Nobody, nobody's talking about any of that. So again, the historical narrative changes over time. The very idea of pilgrimage, uh, let's go back into the, say, 19th century or early 20th century. Were there pilgrimage sites for the majority of Jews? Now, of course, the majority of Jews were in those times pretty poor. The idea of going anywhere was uh, not easily available to them. But even amongst the wealthy, 
Uh, what would have been the pilgrimage site, a place you should go to? Well, of course, we're all familiar with uh, Montefiore, a fabulously rich Jew, um, with a great sense of his responsibility to the Jewish people, who make seven journeys to the land of Israel um, at that time. But that's exceptional. That's exceptional. Would Jews have thought that being a Jew involves the business of pilgrimage at all? Was there any site that you should go to? Did Jews do sites? Were we interested in bits and bobs of places? We might have been interested in perhaps in a building, in a fine building, go and visit this old place. But was there any place that a Jew should visit? Now, those of you who are Sephardim might know that Sephardim in particular, and also uh, Hasidim and other Haredim to some extent, um, do make a big deal out of the graves of great rabbis. Uh, Moroccan Jews, for example, have this tremendous collection of the tombs of, uh, of tzaddikim, of, of, of great teachers or uh, mystical Kabbalistic leaders, and, and they honor and reverence those tombs and visit them. And those of you who've been to Poland might well have seen people going to the tombs of Hasidic, uh, uh, Hasidic uh, rebbies of the past. Or indeed, if you've been to Israel and you've been to Sfat, you've seen people clustering around uh, the tomb of, uh, uh, of Karo, or going indeed to the tomb of Shimon Bar Yochai, um, those kinds of things. So there has been something around the tombs of great rabbis. Not all great rabbis, by the way. I mean, I don't think anybody makes a big song and dance out of the tomb of Maimonides, particularly. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there has been some of that. For ordinary Jews, um, how long do we continue to visit a tomb? So uh, you may well have the custom and tradition of visiting the tomb of your parents uh, and, and maybe your grandparents, um, and not least and especially if they are in the same cemetery. Um, but I'd be quite surprised if anybody has the tradition, unless there's some real kind of historical hook uh, of visiting the tomb of their great grandparents. Uh, how long does one mourn a dead person? Right, so uh, we light a yard candle, don't we, for our parents, for those who are immediately in relationship with us, uh, for our sibling, for our spouse, uh, for our children, God forbid that's our situation. Uh, those are the people we light a yard candle for. Do we normally light a can yard candle for a grandparent, for a nephew, for an aunt? Well, we might feel we should if there's nobody else to do it, perhaps. Um, but generally speaking, the Jewish laws of mourning uh, run out uh, very soon after our immediate relationship. Um, and yet, of course, we're tremendously conscious of the Holocaust with its victims that had no one left to mourn. And in fact, that consciousness is increasing. Uh, back in the 1980s, I proposed the creation of a, can a six wicked candle. Um, I suggested we should have a six wicked candle uh, in the shape of a Magen David with a wick on each of the six points of the candle. Uh, and it should be marketed to be sold, uh, to be used on Yom HaShoah. Because on Yom HaShoah, as you know, uh, we haven't really got anything to do at all. There's no ritual, there's no program. It's actually a day created by the Israeli Knesset. Uh, and the Knesset is essentially a secular body. Um, and so they play sad music on the radio and they do, uh, you know, what the Soviet Union used to do. Um, they, they don't have any, any Jewish rituals for Yom HaShoah. Now we have a service and so we construct something. Uh, you know, they fly flags at half-mast or those kinds of secular activities. I was trying to think of a way in which Jews, ordinary Jews, might make Yom HaShoah uh, reverberate for us. So I suggested this six-pointed, six-wicked candle for the six million Jews. And I proposed it to the then chief rabbi, Lord Jacobowitz, 
um, Lord Jacobovitz, not a man at all indifferent to the Shah in any way. Um, he, he simply poo-pooed it as an idea and said it wasn't going to happen uh, because it's not for us to create new rituals. Um, so that was the end of that. Well, you will now know the campaign to get people to light a Yartzeit candle in the name of one of the victims of the Holocaust, these uh, yellow Yartzeit candles, which have been uh, propagated and, and, and passed out with the single name of someone, ideally try and find information about that individual too. It's a beautiful idea to remember an individual who otherwise has no one to remember them. Um, but how long does that go on? How long do we remember and mourn, as opposed to remember, those who have died several generations before our time? So uh, these are new problems. These are new issues. And the same thing goes in terms of going to a place. Um, what is the place that matters and why does it matter? Now, if you had asked me as a teenager back again in the last century, um, about pilgrimage, I would have known straight away who you're talking about. You're talking about Christians, aren't you? Christians do pilgrimage. I mean, I know the Canterbury Tales. They all go to places of martyrdom, don't they? A place where someone died or something like that. Uh, that's why they go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. They go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land to see the sites where something happened to someone highly significant in their narrative in particular, the death site of Jesus, but also the birth site, um, that, that's also significant, and the site of miracles that were performed, all of that's interesting, you go to Cana to see where the water was turned into wine, and those kinds of things, right, that's a, that's a Christian's visit to the Holy Land, I've often said to Christian groups who tell me that they've been to the Holy Land, uh, what a shame we didn't visit Israel, it's very close by, because the Christian visit to the Holy Land goes to an entirely different place, to the place that most Jews would go to if they went to Israel. Um, and if you ask a Christian, so where do you go then? They'll tell you with great excitement of the 10 different places they visited, and half of them be places you've never heard of. And meanwhile, you would give them a shopping list of places they ought to visit in Israel, and they wouldn't think of going to them at all. Um, so what are the sites that we Jews are supposed to visit and why would we go? Now we of course take Israel seriously, uh, not because of the things that happened there, I mean the most significant things that happened to the Jews all happened outside Israel, I mean in particular in Sinai, the giving of the Torah, the exodus from Egypt, you know those kinds of things. We don't go to Israel because of the things that happened there, we go to Israel because it is the promised land. But once there, we find lots of sites of interest. I remember um, there was a huge amount of uh, excitement and distress um, when we were told that the tomb of Joseph had been disturbed by some uh, Muslims, uh, radical Muslims, Islamists, I don't know who they were, terrorists maybe, uh, they had disturbed the tomb of Joseph and there were a whole lot of Jews running about terribly upset about this. And I asked them, well, where is the tomb of Joseph? Of course, the vast majority of people never been to it, never heard of it, didn't know where it was, right? It's a rather obscure little spot, really. And Jews had never taken the tomb, uh, not all Jews, but most Jews had never taken the tomb of Joseph all that seriously. Um, so I, I guess many of you, most of you have been to Israel. You've probably seen the tomb of Rachel, I guess. I mean, it's not in the uh, cave of Machpelah is one of the uh, the only one of the patriarchs and matriarchs that's not in the Hebron cave. Um, uh, but we go to Israel nowadays. I suspect most of us have not recently been to Machpelah in Hebron. It's not easy to visit now, in, given all the political and military hoo-hahs around it. Um, do we feel ourselves uh, severely denied our visit to Israel because we can't go there? So why do we go? Christians go on, on pilgrimage, we know then, um, to see sites of things that happened, either martyrdoms, miracles, those kinds of things. That's why you go to those places. Right? Muslims go on pilgrimage, a central feature 
of their religion um, is to go on pilgrimage to Mecca. Why Mecca? Because it's the very center of their religious uh, dynamic. Um, uh, uh, and that's where Muhammad did things and said things. And it's the nexus point of, of Allah with, with humanity. And Jews, of course, did go on pilgrimage to the temple, uh, not to Jerusalem, to the temple. No point in going to Jerusalem just if there isn't a temple there. You're going there because of the temple, the pilgrim fest festivals. Just by the way, let's notice that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are not those. So you wouldn't have gone to Jerusalem for Rosh Hashanah. Why, why would you do that? But you go for the three pilgrim festivals when the temple stood in order to be there for the temple ritual. Um, now the temple doesn't stand. What are we going to Jerusalem for? What is the point of that visit? And does Jerusalem become more important than some other site of Jewish historical significance? Um, go to Toledo uh, in the middle of Spain. Uh, no sites really of any Jewish echo except churches, which were once synagogues. Uh, go to Krakow uh, and see the great Jewish quarter of Krakow. Is that more or less significant than going to Jerusalem? Now, of course, we've got um, political articulations surrounding Jerusalem. You know, the great indivisible, eternal, indivisible capital of the Jewish people. Um, tricky to know what the indivisible capital is. Does Bayit Vagan, uh, you know, a, a suburb of Jerusalem, does that uh, automatically absorb the indivisible, holy capitalness of Jerusalem, even though it was never part of Jerusalem in any biblical times or rabbinic times? Um, what is the holy place we have to visit when we go to Jerusalem? If it's the Temple Mount, let's remember, the vast majority of Jews don't go up there anyway. Um, so all we do is we stand outside the garden wall and, uh, and there's somebody just unmuted themselves. Uh, Margaret, um, can, thank you. Um, so uh, in, these, uh, in these situations, what are the sites and why are we visiting them? Now, I've talked about Jerusalem, but let me talk also about Auschwitz. Now, those of you who have been to Auschwitz, I imagine a fair proportion of you have, those of you who have been to Auschwitz will know that actually, of course, it's not a single site. Um, it, it's in fact, it, uh, the whole complex of Auschwitz had about 60, 70 different uh, sites and sub camps and so forth in it. But the two main things that uh, you would visit now if you went to Auschwitz are what are usually called Auschwitz I and Auschwitz II. Auschwitz II also, of course, more properly called Birkenau. Auschwitz I uh, is that famous uh, brick built uh, site with the, the sort of brick two story barracks all around it. It has that famous entrance um, gateway. Uh, with the slogan, Arbeit macht frei, a cynical uh, Nazi slogan on it. Um, many of us would have seen pictures, even if we haven't been there. Now, Auschwitz I, of course, was not so much a death camp as a concentration camp. Uh, the, the British, and perhaps some Jews too, are rather vague about the distinction between death camp and concentration camp. Uh, I think that's because the British liberated Belsen um, and having liberated Belson, uh, that was the uh, mental image of the British for the atrocities of the Nazis. Uh, Belson was never a death camp as such, of course, million, no, thousands of people died there. Um, but they died more through the utter indifference and sheer callousness of the Nazis who ran it, rather than because it was set up to do people to death. It was in that sense, classically, a concentration camp. Um, and as the months unfolded towards the end of the war, it became more and more callous, more and more overcrowded, more and more disease risen. Um, and so when the British came in, they were rightly horrified by what they saw. Um, and so the British have always been uh, pretty vague 
about the distinction between a death camp and a concentration camp. Add to that, of course, that the six death camps, all of which were established in Poland, were inaccessible to us for many decades. And furthermore, four of them were plowed over and disappeared. I mean, the, the, there was nothing to see in Treblinka or Belchitz or uh, Sobibor or Chelno. Um, the, these death camps really were invisible. Uh, and, and of course, too, they did to death most of the people who went to them. So there was hardly any survivors, a, a tiny handful from Belchitz or from Treblinka. Um, and therefore, these places had no uh, resonance in the British mind. Now, Auschwitz, of course, became finally the, um, and especially uh, in, in the 90s and, and into the 2000s, became the defining symbol of the Holocaust. And therefore, it's no surprise that of all the dates that might have been chosen by the United Nations to fix Holocaust Memorial Day, International Holocaust Memorial Day, they chose the day on which Auschwitz was liberated by the Red Army, the 27th of January. They could have chosen any number of days uh, to, to commemorate or mark the Holocaust. They chose that day. Um, and Auschwitz, of course, had much left. Uh, there was much more still to see um, because it was operating right up until the end of the Second World War when the Soviet Union arrived. Same with Majdanek. Um, so, uh, when you go to Auschwitz, you see in Auschwitz I a, a pretty complete set of buildings, and they found there a huge amount of uh, artifacts and objects and evidence and so forth. But it was Auschwitz II, Birkenau, which was the death camp, and there's far less to see there. Uh, there's a few ruins and relics, uh, but not much uh, really at all. As you may know, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, there was huge tension between the church and the Jews, the Polish church in particular, and the Jews, as to who owned Auschwitz. Now, clearly, it's a site in Poland. Uh, the, the Auschwitz Museum uh, organization is run by the, by the Poles and the Polish government. Uh, so in that sense, they obviously own it. But whose memorial site is it? And you'll recall this great dispute about the building of a convent and the putting up of crosses. But you know, if you were to go to Auschwitz I only, uh, you could not deny that this is indubitably a site of horrible Polish death. I mean, Poles did indeed suffer severely in Auschwitz. Many Poles were done to death there. And certainly in Auschwitz I in particular, uh, the narratives of punishment and incarceration uh, are, are frequently Polish. There is, to my mind, one of the most chilling displays in Auschwitz I, uh, in one of the corridors, in one of the buildings, there are photographs of um, a whole range of uh, inmates, of prisoners in Auschwitz. Um, they're all in the striped uh, uniform. Um, and uh, most of them are young. Uh, most of them are non-Jewish. And most of them are looking pretty contemptuously at the, car the camera as if a kind of do your worst. You know, I'm 25, what can you do to me? Uh, and below it, it says, you know, so-and-so, born such-and-such, -such, died so-and-so. Uh, and you realise that none of these people survived. They all lived a few months and died in Auschwitz, mostly in Auschwitz I. Auschwitz II, of course, as a death camp, belonged very much more to the Jews and also, of course, to the uh, Roma to the gypsies. Um, disputing who these sites belong to, of course, is a pretty thankless task. But the question we have to ask ourselves is why are we seeing this site as a site that we should visit not for historical understanding, uh, not for a better sense of, 
what has happened to the Jews, but for some kind of clarification of who we are as a Jew. After all, when one goes on pilgrimage, one goes in order to achieve some kind of uplift, some kind of fulfillment, perhaps uplift is not quite the right word, fulfillment. What is the reason for going there? Uh, now, as I said in the uh, blurb to this session, when March of the Living goes to Poland, it goes to Poland. Uh, it finishes up at Auschwitz, but it would not want to go just to Auschwitz. Uh, I would say there are very little, very few truths or insights or perceptions that you could achieve by a day in Auschwitz. Uh, somehow these things have to be put into perspective. Um, upheaving your emotions, uh, taking you into a place and taking you away from it without any context, uh, I, I'm not sure it does any great good. Um, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so pleased to be associated with March of the Living, because I think it takes its educational responsibilities uh, very seriously. Uh, and Auschwitz, therefore, as the largest and most destructive and most complete and most visible uh, symbol of the final solution, um, certainly rewards a visit. There's no doubt about it that going to see it uh, is critically, critically important, I would say, and I think is part of the educational experience of any Jew who wants to be informed about the Jewish story. In the same sort of way, as I would say that Europeans generally should go to the First World War um, war graves and trenches. They need to understand the, the, the horrors that brought us to the point in which we are. The things that lead us to say, however spuriously, never again. So Jews, I think, visit Auschwitz correctly but should do so in context. Jews visit Jerusalem correctly. Do we need context there? Is Jerusalem a spiritual site and Auschwitz a physical site? Are they both spiritual sites? Are they both physical sites? Why has it become important for so many Jews to see these two places? And are there any other places that as it were, every Jew should see. So I'm going to stop there for a moment um, and I'm going to uh, see whether uh, anybody has any points or questions uh, they want to ask. Um, somebody has uh, commented that uh, Haredim go to Oman um, uh, and uh, that's the tomb of Nach Nachman of Bratslav uh, in Oman, uh, a, a very um, remarkable event that leads a whole range of, in particular, Haredi Jews, but not only Haredi Jews, to leave their families on Rosh Hashanah, um, to be there at the yard site of Rav Nachman of Blatzer. Um, we have become very uh, yard site orientated, uh, and that's not necessarily, uh, by the way, Sephardim don't do it in quite the same way at all, um, much, you know, the, the nearest Shabbat to the yard site is the thing that matters. Ashkenazim are very into yard sites, as the Yiddish name implies. Um, so, folks, uh, any comments or reactions to the, uh, the pilgrimage process of visiting these two places? What is one supposed to get out of it, do you think, uh, to be in either of these two places? historical perspective only, or other things as well? Oh, yes, Dorothy. Uh, can we unmute you, Dorothy? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Dorothy. I've lost you, where are you? Hmm. Ah, there you are. Can you unmute yourself, Dorothy? Um, you were waving. That's me. Yeah, two people were waving. Oh, right. We've got, I've got uh, Rochelle. Rochelle. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, 
Thank you very much for your Tuesday at JW3. Absolutely amazing. Thank Number you. two, I'm a mixed marriage. I'm what you call vuz vuz, married to a Yemenite. And number three, we've been a lot to Safad to the, with the Safadi, and they've got tombs of rabbis in Safad. Yeah, well, as I think I mentioned at the beginning, this business of visiting the tombs of great Jews, that's a thing which, is, uh, which has long existed, and particularly uh, Sephardim and, and Hasidim. I think it's related not least to the... Um, uh, to the uh, a Kabbalistic concept that uh, dead people continue to reverberate, therefore standing near their tombs, connecting to them, uh, has some consequence. Um, I think uh, middle of the road, ordinary bog standard Ashkenazim are slightly less convinced by that concept. Um, but, uh, but yes, it, it does exist. But that's not the same as visiting a cemetery, for example, um, which is no longer in use. So let's take a simple example in the center of London, or the east end of London, for example, there are a couple of um, now disused Jewish cemeteries. And I think we'd all agree that such cemeteries should be kept tidy and respectful and, and decent and so on. But do they need to be visited? Um, we visit them perhaps for their historical interest. We go and see that's an interesting tomb there of uh, so and so who lived in the 1800s or something. But is it a Jewish duty to visit them? Would we arrange for a Jewish school, uh, a youth movement, uh, to make sure they are visited? Or do we say, well, that's a cemetery of its time? It's no longer, and nobody uh, any longer survives who uh, mourns anybody living in that. Uh, buried in that cemetery, uh, let it be respectfully kept, that's all. Um, Michael, I see you've got your hand up. Can you unmute yourself, please? Where, where did I know? Yeah. I, I, I managed to unmute myself. So. Oh, Dorothy, okay, we'll come to you in a moment, thank you. Well, let me just ask Michael's question first, please, and then we'll come to you, Dorothy. Well, you're asking what we thought the comparison between pilgrimages to Yerushalayim and to Auschwitz. And I think they correspond to different aspects of trying to affirm your Jewish identity. For a lot of people, I think going to Jerusalem is the political aspect of the Jewish identity, affirming our link, however Zionist we are, to the modern state of Israel. Going to Auschwitz, however, is a diff totally different aspect. Um, in one way, it's an act of memory of linking to our victims, maybe family, may not be family, but also through activities such as March of the Living, education in our wider history. So I think we're trying to compare not quite apples and oranges, but two slightly different things. And where it's further complicated is where you get religious organizations, whether it's shawls or Chabad, taking people on day trips. And then they're saying, well, it's an important part of your identity, but they're not trying to put it into context. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I think, you know, saying that this is an important part of your identity, but not defining what aspect of your identity is exactly, is, is not necessarily all that helpful. Um, I am struck, you, you, you said uh, Chabad or Shuls. Um, one of the things that struck me uh, whenever I visited sites in Poland is in, almost invariably, I come across Israeli groups visiting. Um, that, that can sometimes be uh, army groups or groups of uh, police officers. I mean, Israel takes very seriously this business of visiting uh, Holocaust sites. Yeah. And of course there is a strong Israeli narrative in relation to the Holocaust. Um, initially, and still for some, it's something about the kind of feeble-minded diaspora jury they left behind who went like lambs to the slaughter and all that kind of narrative. And they're going there in order to reaffirm their own uh, muscular Zionist strength that we would never let this happen. You know, we would, we now exist to make sure it never happens again. That kind of statement. Um, but there's also uh, something about um, uh, uh, martyrdom, the, the narrative of martyrdom. 
Israelis also used to, much less now, but used to, perhaps it switched when they could go to Poland, uh, used to make sure that they took people to Masada. Because Masada is another site of martyrdom. Exactly. But the exactly. difference between but the difference between Masada and Auschwitz is that the martyrdom in Yes. Right. I'm sorry, Dorothy. Say, Dorothy. Say again. No, please. Yeah. The difference is that they chose to kill themselves, as over there we were killed. Exactly that. And this is the interesting shift on the word martyr, right? So uh, a martyr who chooses to uh, give up their lives for a cause is a different kind of martyr to the martyr who doesn't choose to give up their lives for the cause. Um, uh, and I'm interested by the fact that the same term is used Jewishly um, and they are called Kedoshim, you know, holy ones. Um, and um, the, the Israeli authorities seem to have transferred their attention from Masada to these Polish uh, Holocaust sites. Um, but similar sorts of ceremonies are conducted. It's thought to be similarly significant that uh, young Israelis uh, visit these places. Now, Dorothy, you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah. Uh, when, I, when I went to Auschwitz very, very early before you, and uh, um, we, we were looked by the actual <coughs> Uh, people in the village because we walked from we didn't we walked before in the village mm -hmm. like I, I don't know ghost or re, uh, people who came back from uh, they don't know where and I went there Dafka right Dafka because uh, we have to show the world that you don't kill people like that who can think and who can invent and who can write and who have a history. You can't just do that. Mm. Right. Thank you for that, Dorothy. Thank you. And uh, by the way, Davka is nearly always a very good Jewish motivation. Right, so good for you. Um, uh, Margaret, yes. Can you unmute yourself, okay. Margaret? Right. You're muted at the moment. Yes. I, uh, thank you for your very interesting chat. I wanted to say that many years ago, when on our trip to Poland, we went to Tikochin, and the only reason we went there is that there is a wooden synagogue. It's the only reason we went there. We made this uh, um, pilgrimage. And as we were walking along this very Shalom Aleichem looking like village, um, it's not a road, it's a path, um, a little boy of seven, raised his arm in a very um, <coughs> impolite a gesture. And I realized that they imbibe to this day anti-Semitism in their mother's milk because the only people going to this, this Chikotchen, to this synagogue, mm -hmm. which is reconstructed, are Jews. Nobody else is going there. And so they, he made the, he was seven. He must have barely left his mother's breast and he's making this sign. So unless there is a radical change, it's going to continue, I'm afraid. Oh, well, I mean, that's a rather downbeat conclusion. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure that I agree with you. Uh, no, I'm maybe gonna... not. No, may, 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 maybe that was me, but you know, it, he's a boy of seven. Well, I would say a boy of seven hasn't got a clue what he's doing. That would right. be my feeling. I don't think that this is a, a radical okay. political articulation of deep racism. I think he may well have been told that that's what you do when you see Jews, and so he does it. Okay. I suspect he doesn't, doesn't have a clue what it is he's doing. Okay. Um, and okay. there is still an opportunity okay. to deal with him in due okay. course to okay. explore uh, the idea. But um, I do accept that these narratives or these forms exist all the time. Um, and uh, I'm much more concerned about uh, late teenagers uh, yeah. doing that than a little boy. Um, yes, that's right. uh, Clive? Uh, yes. Clive? Uh, sorry, where's that coming from? It's coming from up here. My, uh, it's nice to see you again. You, we met you in Exeter, in the Exeter Shul. I'm Where sorry, I, I can't see. Can you tell me your name? Oriel Newgast. Ah, okay, you're on another screen. Okay, thank oh. you. Yes, Oriel, please go on. 
Yes, my husband, Paul, wants to say We're something to you, here. but you ah, didn't yeah, manage to see him. I'll put a hand up there. Sorry, Paul, go on. Very close. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, a slight caution, if I may. Having visited uh, most of the sites in Poland uh, on one credit, I think my expectation was to be much more dramatic than I came away with. That is to say, there was an element of anticlimax about which I felt a bit guilty because I felt I hadn't really absorbed the terrible atmosphere that I might have been expecting. Um, and I think it's worthwhile keeping that in mind if visiting any of the sites. It is not a thunderclap moment. Um, undoubtedly, I absorbed an awful lot of what I saw and was shown and we were told about. Um, but they are so exceptionally out of this world that they don't, they don't um, create the sort of impact of visiting um, a dramatic site. Uh, I just say that's the slight warning, not not to do, uh, not to diminish in any sense the value and use of visiting them. I, mean, I couldn't be more pleased that I did once, but um, I just leave that with that slight caution. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I look, I think one should be cautious about all of this. I, I've got several people queuing up. I've got Ruth Frenkel. I've got Barbara Marcus. I've got Jill Atfield, I think, so far. But can I just pick up something that Harrison Engler said? Um, he he uh, sent me a note saying the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam oh, has yeah. become a significant site to visit. Mm -hmm. And it certainly is. But in some ways, of course, it's an indication of how careful one needs to be with this narrative, because for many, many people, they think they know about the Holocaust because they've read the diary of Anne Frank. And let's be clear here that broadly speaking, the Holocaust doesn't start until the diary of Anne Frank ends. Right? The diary of Anne Frank is not about the Holocaust. The Diary of Anne Frank is about a program of Nazi anti-Semitism conducted in Holland from which the Anne Frank family had to hide. And then it's just the closing page, more or less, that says, uh, and then the diary ends, and Anne Frank's taken off to Auschwitz first and then Belsen, where she dies of typhus, right? So actually, the diary doesn't give you any insight into the dynamics of the Holocaust at all. And... To, to a considerable extent, and Frank never really meets a Nazi enough to, to engage with it. You can talk about it and explore the ideas and the feelings. Um, so for people to think that they know the Holocaust because of reading the diary of Anne Frank is very odd. Go to the Anne Frank house, and of course they've got much more extensive um, exhibitions and so on, which fill in the story much more fully. Um, so uh, Ruth Finkel, please. Hi, Clive, nice to see you. And you. Um, I have been to Auschwitz on one of these uh, overnight trips and I am planning to go <coughs> with March of the Living when we can go again. Um, my reason for going was to say that I've been there and you can't tell me it didn't happen. Mm. It's, that's, that, was, that is my rationale. My family, thank God, were not impacted um my in the our synagogue being Sephardi we do not we have one lady who is a survivor who is now 96 and much beloved um and she was in Auschwitz and in Belsen um but my rationale for for going and for going on the march of the living is to pass my knowledge on to someone else as you know I am I work in a school and when I first floated the idea of going uh, on the March of the Living, the year six teacher said, would you be prepared to talk about it when you come back to year six? And that's my reason for going, to pass the torch. Well, can I say, Ruth, I think that's admirable. Um, by the way, let's not forget that although in the main, the victims of the Holocaust were Ashkenazim, there were Sephardim, as you've mentioned, uh, not least, of course, the great communities of Greece, uh, but also Jewish communities in, uh, in, um, uh, in the former Yugoslavia, uh, and even some from North Africa. Um, the Sephardim uh, certainly did suffer in the, in the Holocaust too. Um, I, I, as an educator, um, I'm very 
uneasy about what we want to do when we take people to a place. Uh, do we want to, and indeed what we want to do when we do Holocaust education in general. So when I first got involved in Holocaust education, as Cassie said, back in the early 80s, there was no Holocaust education. There had been a couple of remarkable programs, for example, in the world at war. There was an excellent episode about the Holocaust. Um, there, there was some stuff about it, but generally speaking, there was there was none. Um, and such as there was, was going on in youth movements led by wonderful Madrakim, young people themselves, who considered a successful Holocaust program, which they do on Tishbab or Yom Hashvah or something, a successful Holocaust program was one which had traumatized their kids so they couldn't sleep that night or bursting into tears or collapsing in heap or whatever and um horrifying somebody is a very good way of getting them to stop thinking about it right so we actually have to be very careful and thoughtful about how we deliver holocaust education and at what age and what do we want to say to different uh, age groups and so forth um there is a simple fact, which again, I, I remember saying at the time, this might relate to some extent to what Margaret said before um, about the little seven year old. You know, nobody really in the end, especially young people, they don't really love an unpleasant looking victim. Ultimately, the reaction to an unpleasant looking victim is Ugh! right and you can probably train them to withhold their ear to some sort of uh decent response but uh you know empathy or connection is a very difficult thing to achieve um and the idea somehow that the jews are this you know rather useless bunch of people who keep getting in the in the neck and that's what's going to win sympathy and support you know i don't think understands how human psychology works so um i think we have to be very careful how we do that educational stuff and broadly again it's rather one of the things that i like about march of the living uk which is different to the other march of the living groups around the world i like the fact that it doesn't take people until they're 18 or 19 years old it's not about school kids i think you've got to have a certain amount of emotional and um human and experiential ballast before you tip yourself into the middle of that in the same way as in the old days they used to say that you shouldn't study mysticism until you're 40 and married um i feel a bit like that about the holocaust too you've got to have a certain amount of life experience um barbara we're going to come in on you can you unmute yourself please your barbara marcus can you unmute yourself you have to press a button there's probably a button near the bottom somewhere uh, okay. with a picture of it. That's it. You've got it. You've done it. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. I am across the pond, so I don't know if you guys have a delay or whatever, but this is my question, okay? Um, both my parents are survivors. Um, so <clears throat> my, my concern is that, yeah, maybe I would want to go visit Auschwitz. My father was there, okay? Um, but my concern is that I wouldn't give any money to Poland. So even just mm -hmm. landing the plane and paying the airport tax really gets me going. And mm -hmm. um, like if I could just go on El Al, <laughs> you know, and do like a, a, a half hour and then get out, I would do it that way. Um, and, and also what I've noticed is that when, um, let's say I read the London Times, right? And I wanna, you know, do a comment about uh, something pertaining to Jews that I know is true. Um, I'll always inevitably get some Polish person with telling me how I believe in fairy tales. And this is all a lie and it couldn't have happened and specifically addressed about my mother who survived by living in the woods and her whole family was murdered by uh, Poles, not by Germans. And they got like a, a gold coin and they got a sack of flour and I don't know, maybe a possession from the Jew that they murdered. So um, for me, it's a very charged issue. And I don't understand how the Poles, they know about the war, yet they refuse to um, uh, verify what the real history is. They just want to cover it up. Okay. Okay. Well, well, thank you for that, Barbara. And in a sense, that relates to Margaret's comment too. Um, there, it, there is this very, very vexed territory of the Poles and the Holocaust. 
right? There are a couple of things we have to be absolutely clear about this, right? The Poles didn't start the Holocaust, they didn't organize the Holocaust, and the death camps, although they were the six death camps, although they were all in Poland, they were not run by Poles. Right? They've got to be very, very clear about that. OK, um, whether the Poles were and are anti-Semites to a man or a woman or whether there are some or whether there's a very large proportion is a tricky one. And certainly we would be very uneasy if anybody wanted to make generalizations about Jews all being something or other. So we need to be quite careful about doing that about any group of people all being something or other. Um, the history is complicated. And one of the reasons, again, why I like the few days with March of the Living in Poland is the opportunity to explore the diverse aspects of Polish Jewish history. Uh, remember that for a long time, Polish Jews thought that they were singularly lucky to be in Poland, right? singularly lucky. Notice too, if you were in on that um, session, wonderful session about the Ringelblum archive, um, that the Polish Jews had built that Institute of Jewish Studies next to the synagogue in 1936. That is three years before the war, they thought they had a, a, a future in front of them, right? They didn't think this is a place riddled with anti-Semitism. We're all going to have to leave pretty soon. This is a catas catastrophic place. They thought this is a place where putting down roots and building huge buildings and establishing ourselves here. So it's, it's a more complex narrative than that, right? Uh, that's all I think I want to say on it. But Come to March of the Living with me. I'll give you five days on the on the complexities of that. Um, one last thing, sorry to say, is this: we know today that there are uh, fifteen thousand Jews in Poland. Uh, sorry, fifteen thousand and one. No, sorry, fifteen thousand and two. No, sorry, fifteen thousand and three. Why am I putting the number up every minute? Because every week another Jew pops up. Right. Somebody or other says, I've just found out I'm Jewish. Now, if the Poles were so completely and utterly anti-Semitic as we persuaded ourselves to be, and you're a nice Catholic kid who's been brought up by his Catholic parents and he's got this granny who's a Catholic granny as far as he knows. Right. And on her deathbed, she pulls him aside and says, by the way, you ought to know I'm really Jewish and so are you. Right. Mm. What would your average anti C might do in those circumstances? I think he'd grab a pillow and smother his granny before she can tell anybody else. But instead, what does he do? He runs out into the street. Oh, I just found out I'm a Jew. That's amazing. I've got to find the Jews. And right. So what's happening there? What's going on there? How anti-Semitic are the polls? So we've got to get our narrative right as well. We've got to decide who are our enemies and our friends and what's the difference and what's the middle of it. We've got to watch for our own prejudices as Jews, what we're prepared to say and not say about other groups of people as racial groups, as it were. And we also have to remember, it's not the same scale, but before the war, the population of Poland was about 36 million, right? About three and a half million of those people were Jews and the remaining 33 million were Poles, right? Three million Poles were killed and three million Jews were killed. So leaving about half a million Polish Jews alive at the end of the war. But three million Poles were killed. Uh, some of you living in Britain will know that the people are very fond of saying now that uh, the pandemic, which has killed over 100,000 people in Britain, has killed more people than died in the Second World War in Britain, right? So despite all the blitzes and things, we didn't have more than 100,000 people killed in Britain. And the population then was about 40 million. So out of a population of 36 million, 3 million Poles were killed, so 10% of the Polish population. For the vast majority of Poles, surviving in wartime was a very precarious thing. And it's only in Poland that it was a, uh, a death penalty for helping a Jew. In other countries, that wasn't the case. And yet there are, as you know, more Polish trees in the uh, Avenue of the Righteous in Yad Vashem 
than there are of any other nationality. Now, of course, there were more Jews, uh, more Jews to help and so on. But there were an awful lot, 7,000 plus uh, Poles who were prepared to put their lives on the line to save Jews. What does that say? I don't know. And I don't want to, we don't have time, I'm afraid, Barbara, I'm sorry, because we need to move on. And I know I haven't answered or uh, given, uh, Ruth, this is to show you, I don't uh, show special favour to folk with, with titles. I haven't given Ruth a chance or Carol a chance, I'm sorry, nor uh, Mark a chance um, to speak. And I know you've all been waving your hands. Forgive me, we've run out of time. I'm handing back to Cassie. You're muted, Cassie. Hi, hi everyone. Um, wow, Clive, thank you. And thank you for everyone to con for contributing questions and to the discussion. Um, it was super interesting. And Clive has explained throughout the talk a lot about what the March of the Living's education is and how it does differ to most um, sort of experiences, kind of mainstream experiences in Poland and the thoroughness that we go into and the, the intensity of the journey, but the challenging questions that we ask throughout. Um, if any of you are interested in coming with us with Clive um, on our five day journey, I've posted in the chat our website. Um, there's a register your interest button um, on our website, which will um, trigger emails about upcoming programs in Poland that we will be having once we can get back on an aeroplane. Um, so thank you. We are now gonna take a half an hour break um, and afterwards, we are going to hear um, three very inspirational stories from three more of our educational team, again, showcasing a little bit about how we deal with the topic of the Holocaust um, when we're in Poland, but also showcasing three unbelievable stories um, that we feel people should hear and learn from. So I am going to... Um, cancel the record I'm going to close this um zoom for the break and then if you want to come again at 5 30 um, just use the same link and we'll log you back in so thank you very much everyone and thank you again for Clive for giving his time and talking to us all today thank you Cassie